Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. The Projection Booth is single-handedly the greatest film podcast you could ever listen to or could possibly want. Top notch. Five stars. This has quickly become one of my favorite film-related podcasts. Always interesting. A completely unpretentious yet fully comprehensive look at films from all genres. The Projection Booth podcast with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those birds! They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got us a family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast. Here are Brad... Lisa, Brian, and Darren. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. With me is Brian Young. God, I love being a turtle! The turtle dork. The world is bigger than this. Bitch, please. And also joining us is Lisa Gullickson. Quick, suck it before the venom reaches my heart. Wife dork. Maurice, the baguettes, hurry up! And Brad Gullickson. And for gosh sake, watch your language. That's not going away anytime soon. And mouth door. What did one shepherd say to the other shepherd? Let's get the flock out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm your host, Darren Smith. Warm. Warmer. Disco. The disco door. Is that a monkey? And welcome to the It Modcast podcast. What's your quote from? For, it's from Lethal Weapon. It just had its 30th birthday. Oh, mm, that's, that's right. nice. That, that is a classic Martin Riggs joke. I enjoyed it. It tickled me. <laughs> Anytime you can bring uh, agriculture. Wait, is animals agriculture? Yes, no. no. <laughs> livestock, whenever you can bring livestock and swearing together. <laughs> and... That is a bestiality I approve of. What? Whoa. Thoughts of suicide because he wants to kill himself in that movie. My three favorite things. <laughs> what? Uh, all right. Uh, Brian, how was yes. your weekend dork? Uh, actually, it was pretty pretty decent. Um, saw a couple of movies in the theater. Um, yeah. And, uh, more than one? Yeah, more than one, actually. What? Yeah, I know. Not, not just a new release. And uh, I'm actually not going to talk about the, the, uh, the big release. I'm going to save that for someone else. Ooh, but, I wonder um, what he's talking about. I hope that we saw it. Somebody else saw it. Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I, was, I think so. I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. Kong. <laughs> Kong. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's a, a big release. It's a very big release. <laughs> <laughs> not just 30 feet. He's like a skyscraper size now. Got to go up against Gojira. I just listened to the latest <laughs> episode of, of Doug Loves Movies, and he has the director of... Of um, Kong Skull Island on there, and he is so sweet. Aww. He's clearly high, and he clears Whoa. his throat a lot, like Jordan, a lot. Jordan Voigt Roberts. Yes, yeah. but he's so enthused. This is before the movie came out. It was like right before the movie came out, and he was super excited about it. Well, we saw him at Comic Con uh, last year. I don't know if he was high at Comic Con. He was adorable on Doug Loves Movies. Just mm. so sweet. I think he was vaping. Like yeah. I said, clearing his throat a lot, and that is upsetting I to mean, my if ears. If he's on Doug Loves Movies, and you know, when in Rome. That's right. You know, so smoke a lot of Romans. <laughs> I think that's what they say. He's got that's... a massive beard. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I hear. The thing is impressive. Oh yeah. Yeah. For I've heard about the beard. Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but actually, what I want to talk about today is uh... <laughs> not Cog Skull Island. No, 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 no. no. Uh, I guess we hopefully we'll talk about that at some point. We don't know. We maybe, don't know maybe, if that's going to happen you know, or not. The listeners got to stay tuned. Um, I'm going to talk about headshots. Yeah. Yeah, we saw that too. Yes, yes. You guys actually were in the theater uh, in the showing after mines. Oh, you're just showing off because you got to see it first. Yes, actually, uh, actually, actually I didn't. A little, a little. I saw it first. What? Uh, let's talk about Fantastic <laughs> yeah, Fest I know. and how great it is and how <laughs> we all yeah, suck for not yeah. going. <laughs> Fuck you. It's your own fault. <laughs> okay. No. And how was it? So, uh, Sans Darren, I was the, actually the first one to see it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I actually really, really enjoyed this film. Um, a lot. Now, 
of course, this stars Eco Uwas. And at the risk of really um, spoilers, I'm going to stay spoiler free because this is a limited release film. And uh, I want to give listeners, especially the, our listeners, if they haven't had a chance to see it, um, if they get a chance to see it on VOD or Blu-ray release. So I'm going It's to, on VOD uh, right now. You can rent it today. Yeah, This definitely. second, you can hit pause, <laughs> rent that shit, and then come back to Brian's beautiful voice. There you go. Um, so, yeah, but I'll stay spoiler-free. Um, but I do want to give just some of my thoughts about the film. Now, uh, Iko Uwas, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. You are not. No. Uh, you, you waste? You was? Brad doesn't know either. I don't know. Brad's just being a dick. Oh, I'm just God. saying, he's always correcting me on my language. <laughs> it's time for me to tell him that he's wrong. <laughs> Brian, you're wrong. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll look that up so I make sure I get the correct pronunciation of this his name. This bourbon goes to your head quickly. I, I'll just call him uh, Eco. I mean, it might be Ico. I don't know. Um, but, okay, I'm on IMDb, and the uh, synopsis here says, uh, you was plays a young man who washes ashore an am- amnesic with a serious head injury whose past comes back to haunt him shortly after being nursed back to health by a young doctor. Violence ensues. Sweet, sweet violence. <laughs> wow, that's pretty interesting. That's fun. Yeah, that, that, that is a fun synopsis by IMDb. Big ups. Ca- but yeah, that's what the movie is about. It's like a born identity, yeah. but in Indonesia, and with some romance. And you know how I feel about the romance. Yeah. I love it. And, and that was uh, that's something I talked to Darren about after I saw this movie. This movie definitely has shades of, uh, of um, um, uh, what you just mentioned. Born, born, identity. born identity. The Born, the born Franchise. The uh, Born Franchise. Um, it has some shades of like um, Danny the Dog Unleashed. and uh, Oh, man. I love that movie. Yeah. And um, also. Shades of Grey? Shades of <laughs> Fifty, sh- Fifty Shades of Grey. I think it could have used a little bit more of that. With the romance, it was very chaste. They didn't have a lot of time because of the, all of the, um, you know, karate chopping. Yeah. Is that yeah. racist? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they do in Indonesia. <laughs> no. Not a martial They're doing arts. That ex- box shit. <laughs> but um, all elbows. And 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 I also saw a little uh, flourishes of um, uh, I was telling Darren the uh, game of death that kind of reminded me of too because it kind of has like that video game style once you kind of get into oh absolutely I thought you, of that too because it's like different like each each person he meets it's like to get to the boss like the, he's exactly. beating different levels yeah so while watching the film I ha- I started thinking of game of death because you, you know in the police station he fights those two guys and then. Um, the guy who played uh, uh, Bat Boy, that I didn't recognize him from uh, Ray 2, and then we get to the girl on the beach, and all this is leading up to... Uh, and then there's to, the monkey to with the, the barrel. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Bat the, Boy was glasses? I didn't know either. I didn't know and that And Hammer either. Girl was the other girl. Yeah. I didn't girl. know that I, either. No, I knew Hammer Girl was the other girl. Yeah, I, I didn't that. realize Bat Boy was glasses. He didn't. He, it looked unrecognizable. Uh, glasses is the best thing in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Now we know why Clark, uh, Superman wears them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, Shit! But, you're right. <laughs> Take that, <laughs> Superman haters. <laughs> but um, I had so much fun watching this movie. And a lot of people want to make the comparisons because Ico is in this movie to uh, The Raid and The Raid 2. And this movie is not that. Um, nor is it really trying to be that. But for me personally, I that's one reason why I love this film is because it's not The Raid. Um the fighting style, the, the 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 filmmaking techniques, the what the filmmakers do, the the resourcefulness of how they shoot the action sequences, I think is very inventive and very different from anything that we've seen before. Uh, it, it, well, anything we've seen, kind of specifically from the raid, it was a little bit jarring to me because they do a lot of shaky cam yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, but just the way they move the camera. Uh, the way they edit uh, to kind of stitch certain things together, I thought was very inventive and very resourceful. Uh, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, but, you know, talking about the shaky cam and, you know, it really it does feel like the green grassification of <laughs> yeah. action cinema yeah. has uh, found its way over into Indonesia. Um, the... You know, there was a moment of disappointment at the, during the very first sequence where the bad guy, oh, in the jail, Lee, when he escapes from prison, and yeah, in the jail, the okay. opening scene, the action is so not as interesting as the raid. Uh, I, it was impossible for me to leave my love of that film behind. And it it took that romance, that relationship, the actual plot of this movie to win me over. 
Because honestly, I think the action in Headshot, despite being pretty inventive in its violence or clever or uniquely grotesque, the action itself is okay. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's. I don't know. I, it felt, you know, you know, you're talking about going from one boss to the next. The, you know, the 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 hand to hand combat I enjoyed, but anytime a gun came out. I felt like it was incredibly mediocre. I liked the fight in the office with the desks. Yeah, yeah. I thought that that was station. really cool. And that that involved like a combination of gunplay and hand-to-hand combat plus like just the um the athleticism of all that and the fact that our hero is getting exhausted. That's what I appreciate about the film because he's not like this superhero person who takes down everybody and doesn't get hurt. Like he, you see him throughout this movie, he's getting sliced up. Uh, he's getting beaten and broken and, and beaten down. By the end, I mean, you feel like he's going to pass away from it, sheer exhaustion. It, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, there were a lot of things that I really took away that I liked from it and I, I enjoyed that opening sequence. That really oh, got me invested. I did not. Interesting. But, well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> sorry about, sorry about. This is what I, I, want share, I want to share a moment with my fellow dorks and our listeners a personal moment <laughs> and just gonna make you have to go back and listen to every freaking episode that brian's on i love <laughs> okay. i love when brian says Huh, interesting. I love when he says interesting. Yeah, I, what love he's the, saying I, is, I love the implications yeah. of that. Yeah. He's so nice and diplomatic yeah. about it's so Brian. Yeah. Huh, he's like, interesting. That's, that's interesting. Uh, you're you're wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just a different take from the way that I see it. I, I get it. I know why you're saying it. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I just love when you say it because I know what it means as far as, as it relates to you and your personality. It like means like, Brad is... Being a dick. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Why shit on Brian's love? That's, no. that's Brian's way of saying like, huh, I hear what you're saying. I respect that. But I still don't see that shit the way you see it. I don't see where, where well, you... Well, that's... Yeah. And, and that's nothing wrong. I'm not saying anything. I just love when you say that. Because oh, I know what it means. Okay. And it's the nicest way that anyone can say that. Huh. It's, it's, interesting. It's uh, interesting. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah. But let me finish talking about my weekend door, Brad. Stop interrupting me. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're good. You're good. But, yeah, that's, that's a good observation, Darren. And then you're right. <laughs> but, um, but, but, uh, but another thing, like you were saying, the romance, I really, really got invested into um, the relationship that he has with this young doctor. Um, Eileen or I, Eileen. Yeah, I, Eileen. Oh man, it was so, so good. I, I and especially where it goes. Again, I don't want to. I want to stay away from spoilers. But the moment where it goes to at the end of the film, mm-hmm. uh, when she learns what you know is going on with him and his amnesia, um, I just thought that was just a, such a great, beautiful moment uh, between the two of those uh, characters leading up to that. Especially the the relationship that they built between the two of them. So. I, again, I just love the way a lot of these foreign. I talked to Darren about this, like the way these foreign films are able to kind of build, build character and build relationship throughout uh, the progression of the action. Um, and we saw that too with the uh, with the backstory between um, Eco uh, and uh, Hammer Girl um, or whatever. I forgot. I don't Rika. I don't, don't want to. Yeah, uh, Rika. Rika. I don't want to huh? call her Hammer Girl. Uh, She'll always be Hammer Girl. Yeah, but I, I don't want to not pay respect to this film and her character. It's but, Rika. Uh, Rika. And, um, Julia it, Stell is the actress. Oh, okay. And uh, doing uh, just where that led to and then um, the reveal of their backstory and uh, the decision and choice that she makes at the end of that fight I thought was such a beautiful moment. Um, yeah, I, I really, really liked this film a lot. I really enjoyed this film. Like you said, Brad, the raid, it is not. Uh, but to me, that's, that's what I found refreshing about it. I think the only comparison that this movie could, the only way, the only way that it would compare to the raid is in that the with the raid films, what that brought about as far as the depiction of violence in a martial arts film. Like, I mean, normally in, oh, yeah. in, yeah. in films where you have a guy punching a guy, it really is about the technique and how the kick looks and how it's framed. And the guy would get kicked in the face and he'd spin around and he'd do a pirouette and hit the ground. <laughs> well, in the raid, 
there was a there was an added element of brutality because mm-hmm. if you think about it in real life terms, if you're standing face to face, toe to toe with someone, and you kick them in the face, that there is enough. That's really brutal. I mean, to see that in person to, and to do that to have that happen to you, that's brutal. It's truly so. Sad. With movies, we've got we've got to the point now where when that happens, it's as Brad said to Brad, a shootout. It's just mediocre. So we've we've come to the point where just seeing a guy get kicked, Was that a just seeing a shootout. No, no, no. But you have to say mediocre the right way. Mediocre. <laughs> so we got to that point where it's just mediocre to see a shootout or or, or a regular kick and a punch. So in, enter Ang Bak. Enter where Ang Bak uh, ushers in the era of okay, yeah. we're not gonna we're not gonna have the, the 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 punch angle to where it looks like he got hit. We're gonna show you full contact. And then the evolution of that is the raid where. Okay, yeah, we may or may not have full contact, but it's not just going to be a punch or elbow to the face. There's going to be a, an added level of intensity to the way that these people are dispatched. But, uh, Brad and I, we had the rare and distinct and wonderful pleasure of being in the theater all by ourselves. So every time one of those um, like extreme contact kicks or punches or falls would happen, Brad would point at the screen and go, dead. <laughs> just died. He's, surely he's dead. Yes. <laughs> like and that so, would kill you. And he's so, dead. I, and, and with Headshot, I think that's the only similarity to the rate in that they have taken that baton of, okay, let's let's see if we can depict this act of violence in an even more brutal way. Let's escalate the depiction of it. I mean, that, that's it. Not, not in the, okay, the rate is just nonstop. It's, you know, going to a building, a simple setup, one location, it's game of death. Get from the bottom floor to the top floor, yeah. and in each battle, escalates until it's just all out, you know, war or whatever. That's really the raid. And then each fight and set piece, let's escalate and show a different, uh, and a different finishing move, a different way to dispatch these guys, and also just to showcase this talent that is eco, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> that's really the that's really the raid in a nutshell. Yeah. But with headshot, the headshot is m- more concerned with putting those violent elements. In, um, in, in a more character-driven story. And Do you because- know what, what Headshot reminds me of is a, a step-up movie. It's a step-up movie. It has a, a plot line and a story, but the story, it's beautiful, but it's way cheesy magoo. It's a very thin. It's very, it's very and thin the, and yeah. it's really about the romance between the guy and the girl, but their romance is extremely chaste and sweet, just like the step-up movies. And then... Um, and it's about getting from dance to dance. It's getting from fight scene to fight scene. So it's more about getting to see the violence. And the violence isn't, like, it's brutal. And yeah, they're getting stabbed and stuff like that. But it's it's also really pretty. And it's just kind of cool to watch. Yeah, the shaky cam and the gunplay kind of distracts occasionally from that hand-on-hand combat. Yeah. But it's it's the kind of thing where I'm a person who, like, in, in action scenes, I generally get pretty bored, and I'm just waiting for the action scenes to finish. Yeah. I found these action scenes to be pretty engaging. Yeah. I enjoyed watching... I enjoyed watching them. Yeah, and, and I think... But I wouldn't say that this is any kind of, like, you know, high... This is not high art in terms of, like, story and plot and character. Well, no, as Lisa, far as story, no, I don't, I don't think so. Lisa, either. have you seen The Raid and no, Raid 2 yet? No, I have not. Oh, you have Those been. of you who... I'm about are, to ask you, yeah. Have, yeah, yes, I so have not, I, so I'm not seeing that Do you that have them on the Blu-ray? Because if not, I can... Uh, I have them on Blu-ray. Okay. Lisa and I have started... Lisa's got homework coming up. Yeah, yeah Lisa does have it. <laughs> Done. And, and, Done. And, and we've started The Raid, and, and you know, the, the Raid opens up, and it's a really scary... First scene where the main bad guy has lined up all oh, his guys, right. yeah, yeah. and he is, you know, shooting him in the head. And so yeah. we started it, and Lisa just was not in the mood at the time to watch a guy slowly execute six people, yeah. <laughs> and she's just know. like, ah, "Is Titanic on?" <laughs> and I'm sure we <laughs> watched you. a bunch of Titanic. <laughs> yeah, scenes. that's what we did. Just on YouTube, not the film. We just went from like Jack scene to Jack scene. And see the thing, the di- <laughs> another difference that's the thing that separates the raid portrayal. from Headshot is that, like what you said, Lisa, it is like the Step Up movies, but the Step Up movies, they give you that cheesy romance, so that in between dance scenes, it has you have that to latch on to, you know, hang in there until the next day, and that's what Headshot does because with the raid, the, when once you see it and you compare it to Headshot, you think the raid. I mean, you think Headshot has uh, a, a fairly straightforward or you know, barely their story, quote unquote, storyline. The raid, as far as lead character goes, I mean, it's really thin. It, it yeah. is really thin. It, and it, the raid really feels like 
it's about okay, just getting to the next uh, set because there are there are many more action set pieces and fights in the raid than there are in mm-hmm. Headshot. Yeah, but that- I got the sense from Brad like that watching the raid and then watching Headshot was a little bit of a, a step backwards in what Brad wanted to see on the screen. Well, yeah, because if you could if you compare it Fact. definitely if you compare <laughs> the raid to Headshot, I can see the disappointment. I text Brian before as he was going in there. I said, look. Remember, oh, yeah, yeah. the yeah. headshot is not the raid, and it's not trying to be. It's a totally different beast because the headshot is, like you said, is trying to get you to invest in this quote unquote cheesy love story, so that when you get to those fights with Eco, they have weight because you're invested in that character. Whereas in in the raid, it's really not. I, I don't think that that same thing applies. You well, kind of know. He's just a badass. Well, he establishes he, it the from the raid, onset. I, I am curious to see how Lisa reacts to that film because, as she just stated, she's not, you know when action scenes occur, mm-hmm. she takes a nap, and that's, that's ninety all, minutes of, of a nap. An action <laughs> <That's> scene. <laughs> a ninety minute nap, Lisa. But, but that's a ninety minute nap that then gets you to the raid too, which yeah. still has some really epic action sequences. But that's where the story opens up, and that's, like that's when it becomes a saga. If yeah. you compare any two films, I would say The Raid 2 deserves more of a comparison to Headshot than the first Raid. Be- only because of there is more of a story, and there is more of a narrative. The scope of that opens up hugely. And have, the you raid, watched, have you done those back-to-back? I have not that should done be them when, back-to-back. That should be when Lisa yeah. experiences it uh, back-to-back, when you watch them with her like that. So we just got to find four hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh but yeah, I'm yeah. glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, definitely definitely enjoyed the film. Um so yeah, yeah, definitely gets a thumbs up for me. Again, I would just caution listeners, like Brad said, check it out. It is on VOD. Um it should be on it should be on streaming. That it's prison true. break scene in the movie had no reason to be there. Uh the, oh, beginning? the beginning? Yeah, the that very the... That, Yeah, well So it's been it since really September didn't... since I saw it. So who it never is that really the main came bad guy? Yeah, yeah that was Lee. Lee gets broken out of yeah. prison, okay. but no, nothing really comes of that. Because in the, well, the time, I think it's just more of a, uh, an introduction to his character. It, it's, yeah. yeah, it's to establish him as. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when you start with this huge jailbreak scene, I just didn't think that jailbreak scene was particularly interesting. It or was well very dark. It was dark. I don't know. It was all very shot, very close. Um, but seeing that but guy's he head is against great. the wall, that the villain, oh, wow. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. So by the time you got to the end, and you, you know, he has his final showdown with our hero. Uh, you really just wanted to see him get punched. No, do you know what? To me, like three quarters of the way through the movie, I lean over to Brad and I go, "Do you know who that is?" And he's like, "What? Who?" And I go, "That's the Indonesian Doug Benson." <laughs> <laughs> and if you look oh, at him in a yeah, certain light, yeah, oh, he always yeah. looks doped out. He and he's, he's got the same like round face and the like deep set eyes. Yeah, those eyes. <laughs> I can see in the eyes. So yeah, it's hard to take him seriously then. And you know, the other joke we had throughout this entire movie was the bad guy, whenever he would walk into a room, he had like a brick of heroin and then the, the brick <laughs> oh, of heroin. Oh, they were wrapped in like kind of like taupe wrapping yeah, paper. It, it looked like each brick of heroin was like a packet of graham, graham crackers. Graham crackers. Mm. I was like, so, ooh, graham crackers. <laughs> so every time. Lisa, don't you eat those graham crackers. <laughs> I would, yeah, I'd be like, oh, I hope you brought some marshmallows. <laughs> I tell you, don't there really is that. something to having a theater all to yourself. Yeah. You know, you could easily watch this film on demand in your home, and you would have access to the fridge and snacks and the bathroom and, you know, your phone and a magazine. And you would not engage with the movie in the same way that yeah. even a theater all to ourselves, where, you know, sometimes when you go to the movies, you got to be quiet. Yeah. And you would think. Having the theater yourself would offer you more distractions, but actually, Lisa and I engaged with Headshot incredibly, uh, in a very intense way, and and we could discuss it as we went and, along, yeah. and we found things to to laugh about. And the privacy is great because it's not like Alamo where you have people. Co- so we con- conceived our first child. If it's a <laughs> oh, if it's a boy, it's going to be Karen. named Eco Uwais. <laughs> If it's a girl, it's going to be named Sunny Pang. Oh. <laughs> Mom and Dad, Lisa is not pregnant. No, I'm not. Never will be. You have a lifetime of disappointment. But the, you're, you're absolutely right. But you I, know, I mean, this, this is a movie that you should see with the audience, though. Like, remember no, it, seeing it Ray would... with the audience at E Street? 
I mean, yeah, the, the, the Ray was great. That, that the Ray was, was, I agree. Ray was great. But Every movie you should watch with an audience that is fully engaged. But I do see the benefits in what you're saying of because uh, again, like with Lisa not being a huge fan of action sequences and that's her nap time. Um, it surprised me. But it also pleases me that you were able to engage with it. Uh, it's actually the first movie I have not slept through at least part of in huh. a long time. <laughs> well, this has been a very sleepy week <laughs> uh, yeah. for Lisa. We're having, you know, like we have a. Apparently, we're going to have the snowstorm on Tuesday. So the barometric pressure has been whacking. I don't know if you've migrating. noticed this, uh, internet, but the world is dying. <laughs> And every day is a different weather system. It's Geostorm. <laughs> yeah, it's Geostorm. We're Gerard oh, Butler, Jesus. where are you? We're living the trailer for that movie. So, <laughs> you know, you'll have a day here in Virginia that's 80 degrees, and the next day it's sleeting. Yeah. That happened this week. So yeah. what happens? Migraine town. Migraine town. Yeah. Lisa's been miserable for the last five days. And making yeah. my spouse miserable. But I did. do you know what, when I wasn't miserable? Headshot. Yay. I enjoyed that film. But I did sleep through, oh, what did we watch? And I slept through and you were like, King you- Kong, the Peter Jackson movie. <laughs> yeah, they showed the Peter Jackson, I King literally Kong. said to Lisa, this is, you know, whenever we t- watch a King Kong movie, it's a really important, you know, experience for me. And <laughs> I said, fuck that. No, I swear to God, we had this, uh, this is the conversation I had. I said, Lisa, I am so excited that we're watching this together for the first time on the big screen. Yeah. It, it's a movie with it has its own flaws and problems, but this is such a beautiful movie and I'm just so excited to watch it with you. Fucking eat your salad, gone. <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's nice. And, 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 I, and, and, dude, King Kong hadn't even shown up yet. Uh, to be fair, he doesn't that show up movie, at least until an hour still, into the film. I still, I <laughs> still, that, that like, is true. The, the, the crime, the crime is, I slept through with a third of the movie. I still got to see two hours of the movie. Brad will not let me rate it on Letterboxd. You cannot, you cannot rate King Kong on Letterboxd without watching the introduction of King Kong. I think if I watch over oh, 180 man. minutes no, or something, no, I no, no. You gotta watch also, it from last to night, credits. I'm calling her out again. She Dude, never watched Zodiac, my 18th that's favorite not film of all time. true. I've seen Zodiac, and I've stayed awake through Zodiac, and I had a migraine, and I took so much medication. I was medicated. I, and, and I had the same conversation with Lisa. I was like, I know you fell asleep during King Kong, but you should know that this movie means a lot to me, and our marriage is lasting on this relationship of this this these three hours, and I just need you to stay awake, okay? And she was like, okay, let's do that. Lake Berryessa murder happens, boom. Sleep. Uh. I, I fell asleep when uh, the chick from, uh, what's that movie? Say Anything showed up. She yeah. showed up. She's like, where's my baby? Z's. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> anyway, spoilers for But her. I love Zodiac. It I love homework. that movie, and I've fucking seen it We're before. going to talk about that. Stay tuned for It My Homework, uh, everyone. Uh, that's our way of saying that. Um, but anyway, Brian. Yes. That's all you got for your weekend. Though. Here's the thing. Uh, also, if you liked um, uh, Headshot, uh, check out Reborn. Which yeah, I is Tok Sakaguchi's an interesting thing. I saw, and I'm not saying this, but I, I saw both of these films back to back Reborn blah, blah, blah. and Headshot. I'm not saying where and where. Fantastic Files. But ironically, <laughs> they both uh, share similar um, elements as far as a guy who is this badass dude, mm. is used to, has this history of this program that raises young kids to be assassins, these okay. special assassins, and then that his, that past coming back okay. and calling them back into it. I'm really also has a uh, very inventive action scenes and fight has fight has a fight style that has not ever been filmed Same. before. Okay. So yeah, I th- definitely check that out. But I can't wait to see Colossal for the first time, Brian. Yeah. Are you really excited um, to see that actually, Lost Weekend actually, seven yeah. coming up? Yeah. This week this, uh, wait, today's oh, so in a few more days. Yeah, just in a few more days. Hopefully, we'll get yeah, we'll all be seeing it for the first time. Nobody no, else has seen that exactly. movie before. Talk about how great it is know, every day. I know. Texting me it's all the never, time. It hasn't been on anyone's <laughs> top ten list except mine. <laughs> 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 guess what? I saw it at Fantastic. Bye, bye, bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm excited. Remember our first Lost Weekend, Brad? When we had we got snowed in. Was that our first one? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Lost Weekend three. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. It's gonna that happen again. That was sad. That was one I did not get to go. Sorry, Lisa. I took care of your husband. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Reach around. But, uh, Lisa, uh, oh, sorry, Brian. 
Oh, we can do it. oh no, no, no. Yeah, that's that that ends it for me. But just to kind of close it out, um, I mean, I can do this at the end of the show. But go check the YouTube page out. There was a lot of trailer releases. Put out a, a, a lot more content. Um, we may be talking about that a little bit more mm-hmm. uh, during the show today because mm-hmm. we had a because someone has a lot to answer for. Yeah, we have a uh, Geo Storm, uh, Tom Blonde, Baby oh, yeah. Driver, Wonder Woman, Fate of the Furious. And, a lot oh, of trailers. Which one? What? What? What other? What other trailers coming out? Uh, what came uh, out? Hashtag F eight. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, make your way to our it my YouTube channel. Go ahead, check out all the content there. All right, Lisa, your yes. week in dork. My week in dork. Um, was it headache filled? Like seriously, you had a migraine really, all week. It was. It was. It's been a headache filled. Uh, really, ex- and it's like the kind of headache where it's just like I'll be fine. Stabs, stabs in the eyes and the head, and it got to the point where it was just like. I, like, I feel like right now, if you, like, took a melon baller to the center of my skull, you could just get a scoop out of, oh. my, of my head. If, so, if like, Indiana just... Jones, Temple of Doom, monkey yeah, meals. Yeah, I am, I'm, I'm full-on monkey meal right now. Oh, sorry. With a side of fries. Have you tried cocaine? Because that usually <laughs> Whoa. kills everything. It's a hell of a drug. <laughs> Kills headaches, kills you. I mean, no more pain, dude. That don't tell her great. that, man. I'm telling you, if if she found out the cocaine would cure her headaches, we would be in a mountain of scar. We would have the highest ratings of coked up Lisa on it. Oh my god! I don't know. I'm already pretty high energy. The last thing, oh, like man. this cultural climate wants, is a a woman who already talks too much to talk more. Smack that lady down. <laughs> Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yes. Your weekend week- door. Uh, before the migraine set in, Brad and I did get to have a nice evening out. A last evening out. No. A nice evening out. We went to the Warner Theater, mm. and we got to see Patton Oswalt oh. again, yeah. which is so awesome. I can't remember what the name of this tour is. Is it just the All Things Are Sadness, My Wife Is Dead tour? Oh, Correct. No. Really? That's the name of it? No. Oh, I just be- came up with oh, that. Oh, I was going to say shit. I mean... Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Ta- so I feel like Lisa, myself, uh, Darren as well, um, we know Patton Oswalt, right? Well, yeah. That's not actually true, but we've met him a bunch uh, at the Alamo One Loudon because he's done a bunch of uh, screenings out there. I've and, touched him. I've yeah, I have body. a really we, unattractive we have, picture with him. We actually have multiple unattractive photos with him. <laughs> and well, he looks great. We, we saw look, a like secret ogres. movie once with him. We can't talk about what the oh, movie yeah, was, but right. it's still one of my all-time favorite experiences in life. A secret screening, Lisa, uh, Darren, remember? I remember. I wasn't even there. Yeah, I know, because he knows how powerful a secret screening that was. <laughs> Where it was just us and the Dude Bro Party Massacre oh. guys. Wasn't that the best? Oh, we, oh shit. Yeah, we can't talk about it. Oh. And that is still like a highlight of my life. It was wow. like Lisa getting married. And then that secret screening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I feel like since we spent that time with him every now and again, that... You know he's our stand-up comic. You know he's he's a native. He's an Ashburn native, um, and so any time that we can, you know, read his books or watch his Netflix special or head out to the Warner Theater, it's like a, it, it it feels like a closer experience than if we had seen I don't know, name somebody funny, Lisa Stephen Wright. Yeah, if we saw Stephen Wright. Plus, Stephen Wright is a completely like he's like a one-liner guy. Where Pat Oswalt comes from the school of where he really does talk about his life. Um, but going into this, this particular show was a little bit going like, we don't know what to expect because of the passing of his wife, which was now, I think just over a hundred days ago. And, um, I had just seen him in the Lloyd kill Martin special 45 jokes about my dead dad, where that must have been recorded right after she passed away, and he couldn't even say what had happened. He mm. just said, you know, I've recently had a horrible tragedy in my life, and I don't think that I could... He, he said that he, he doesn't think that he could tell jokes about it. He straight up said he didn't. He couldn't tell jokes about it. So going into the show, but at the same time, he's all over Twitter and Facebook, mm-hmm. kind of being this advocate for grieving and the grieving process and he's he's written really heartfelt articles about what it's like to have a daughter and have to to carry on because of her and uh so brad and i were kind of looking at each other going is it going to is it going to come up 
is it is it going to come up? So, um, uh, so yeah, so we went into DC. We actually met there because Brad was Brad was working, and we went right into the theater. He did have an opener. Uh, her name was Iman El Husseini, and uh, she was an interesting lady. She uh, she was from Iran. Um, but she is a lesbian who is married to a Jewish woman. And so that, I think, and in this particular political climate, she has a unique perspective that needs to be heard. And I thought that that was a really cool choice for an opener. I wish she had talked more about that experience. She did a lot about, like, kind of typical dating stuff. And um, my favorite parts were when she was talking about her family. Like, you know, I'm all into, like, the, the personal stuff. Um, and she had, uh, I thought a pretty cute bit about, uh, the fact that her parents' actual wedding anniversary is 9-11. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so, uh, I don't know. It was just funny. You had to be there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice. I love to discover new people and, um, and I, I love opening comics, so I was excited. And then he comes out and he starts off the show with doing like this doing like crowd work i can't even specifically remember well i mean uh you know he told sort of typical jokes but at the same jokes like we're in dc Mm. uh the world's going to shit what is your job sir in the front oh you have a regular dc job that's not funny what's your job oh you also have a fairly regular dc job that's not really funny either um, oh, but there was like one. There was a guy who uh, grows medical yeah, marijuana. Yeah, he was a lawyer and now sells weed. Yeah, but this was his first batch he'd ever grown, so he, this was new, new, new experience for him. So yeah. yeah, and it was basically Patton, and he says this. He he's like, I don't know what I'm doing up here. Why am I doing this crowd work? Oh yeah, because I'm just delaying time until I have to talk about something really awful, terrible, and shitty. Mm. My wife died. And then you're like, all right. Here we go. Here we go. And this was a very raw performance. Absolutely. He had a a piece of yellow legal pad. Like, it's kind of normal to see, like, maybe a scrap of paper of a set list. Or an iPhone. Yeah, it's not unheard of to see. But he had a straight up big piece of paper that he would... Like stand up and look at, and and even at one point he he apologized for having to use the paper, and he says, "I sometimes I get distracted by the sadness," and I'm just like, Jesus Christ. But even with that, Paul, you know, even with him dealing with this really tough material, he still managed to find the heart and really actually find the funny. Like he he talks about. Um, the process of having to tell his daughter and letting his daughter decide what was best for her. And so... Um, How old is his daughter? Seven. Oh. His daughter is seven. So um, he, you know, he he waited until the next day, uh, as per, I think, his the principal's suggestion, the principal from the school suggested that he wait until the next day. So he waited until the next day and told her in the morning. And um, she ultimately decided that she wanted to go to school. And that's what she wanted to do. And so he took her to school. And then, you know, he gets there. And then he has to deal with the questions from the kids. And, of course, kids are like insensitive jerks, self-centered, curious jerks who want to learn about life. And so... You know, he found some real funny about, like, talking to the kids and how blunt kids can be, um, you know, uh, asking, like, things. And, like, when the kids ask the questions, you're kind of getting an insight into their lives because kids are coming up going, like, uh, so are you going to find her a new mommy? Because when my parents split up, I got a new mommy, like, right away. And Patton goes like, oh, I bet you did. I just got an insight into that. So he talked a lot about that. He also talked about, uh, you know, Mother's Day and, the, like, the week of Mother's Day. Like, you can't have a kid in a, a, at school the week before Mother's Day because, of course, all of the art projects, all of the writing projects, all of that stuff is going to be, like, geared towards that. Mm-hmm. And so um, he talks about 
you know, taking his daughter away and, and having, like, a, a nice Disney vacation and things going really well and then going, and then having a Polish TSA agent go, like, I heard about your mother and uh, I had my mother pass away and you never get over it. <laughs> and so then he had to deal with a crying child on a plane. Huh? You know when Pat Nozzle does it, it's real funny. No, you guys it, are looking but, but, but it wasn't funny. Like, it was, like, he... You're you're right. He found comedy. He found what he does best in the tragedy that is his current life. But it felt like something Rah. else. It felt like something beyond a stand up. Like it wasn't like Well, because funny isn't slipping on a banana peel. Funny is funny is the situation looks like it's going to be this and life offers you that, and isn't that crazy? What I, what, but what I'm saying, Lisa, is that witnessing this, um, again, I don't want to call it stand-up, this... this uh, it was stand-up. Yeah, but I, it wasn't. Like, he was telling jokes, but it felt like cathartic release for him. It felt like something... But that's look, what all stand-up is. That's what stand-up is. Stand-up, like, the stand-up that I love... You feel like you get to know somebody yes, intimately. I, I agree, and I know that's why you love the, those particular stand-up individuals. Stand-up individuals. I don't fucking <laughs> understand comedy. I don't like it. Uh, but what this was, this felt more spoken word than any other uh, honest, genuine stand-up show you've taken me to. This felt like something special. It felt like something that he needed to do to get beyond the horror of his current situation to live his life. I you think yes. I, I agree with that. And it's definitely something that's transitional. Um, he's clearly working working the bits out still. But I can see this in a year becoming an HBO special, becoming a Netflix special, uh, being on CISO or Epix, and being something really polished and beautiful and funny. Like, I think this is the road to funny. I think that it was an extreme privilege to get to see this show in this stage because I think that this this can turn into something that is huge and something that a lot of people are going to identify with and a lot of people are going to find a lot of humor in and solace in. So, um, yeah. Man. But I still think it's stand-up. So you think that he was like, kind of working out some material while at the He's same time He's working out grieving. some bits and working out his feelings, right? Yeah. So, um... This felt like, you know, how the sausage is made. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, a rough draft of something. And the fact that he gets to do this in a theater as opposed to a club is but a testament to his what was career. so amazing to me was here is an, uh, a human being going out there and exposing himself um, to a, a bunch of strangers because that's what his profession is. But this felt like a very singular moment in this man's life. And, you know, he, he did two shows. And, and he's, you know, that night, he did an 8.30, which is where we were at, and he did a 10.30. And I, I kind of wish we had seen both shows because I would love to know what that second show was like compared to the show we saw. Because either... The improvised stuff that that I I assume was improvised is actually incredibly written and well crafted, well timed bits to make me feel the way that I currently feel about Pat and Oswald. Or the second show was something completely different. You know, we we've seen you know, thanks thanks to Lisa, I've seen so many great comics and so many great shows and so many you know, mediocre shows also, uh, things that did, I did not identify with. But because I, you know, I knew I had experienced Pat Oswalt before, you know, Lisa and I had gotten together. I have a relationship with him and his books and his stand-up comedy before this special. And then we had our relationship, <laughs> our relationship, again, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> but this like weird, my, you know, my own imaginary bond with this man, thanks to the Alamo Draft House. And to see him on stage, I was crying listening to this stand-up. It was heartbreaking. He found the humor. He's super smart. He's wickedly clever. He is biting. 
But this was gut-wrenching to watch because of the reality of the situation and that rough draft quality. And I don't think, you know, I hell, I hope I never see something like this again. Right. That's all I'm trying to say. Right. It doesn't feel like uh, I go to Netflix and I watch Jim Gaffigan's latest. Or even the Tignataro special after her breast cancer. Like, that was a crazy... Um, but you should listen to... So, that's a great example. Because Tignataro, that special... And her entire career came from one moment where she had obligated herself to do an evening of stand-up on, like, not, like, and starring Tig Notaro, but as in the context of a show. And um, she had just been diagnosed with cancer, like, within two weeks, had just been diagnosed with cancer. And, um, and... She was just too professional to cancel that evening. So she did 20 minutes of stand-up, which is now um, compiled on it as an album called Live. And she, it's just like the most raw, emotional thing ever. And she's on the stage telling the audience, like the way that she walks out onto the stage is, Hi, good evening, I have cancer. And, you know, saying, like, I, I don't know how to tell jokes right now because I've just been diagnosed with cancer and all of these other horrible things have happened. And it is the most... And you laugh, you know? Not, ha, 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 you've got cancer, but isn't life ridiculous? You know, you've already had all of these health problems and personal problems and life gives you cancer? That's ridiculous. And you laugh. That's what comedians do like painters go paint a painting poets write a poem comedians go out and they tell jokes and it's and it's raw and sometimes it can make you cry and it can move you but ultimately you laugh and and that's stand up so you should listen to you should listen to live and then compare it to the special where she takes her shirt off like it's they're two completely different animals because of because of that unfinished product it's going to be a hell of a great podcast the next episode after I die of liver failure. <laughs> and Lisa's just I promise nailing you, it. I promise you, if Brad dies, I will no longer be on the podcast. You Brad, guys, you two are just going to have to go alone. The D&B show. Yeah, I, I, I've already got my plan. If Brad dies, I'm moving back in with his parents. Oh. With his parents. <laughs> and it's going to be called the Gullickson House of Sadness. And I will accomplish nothing else ever again, ever. No, oh. I want you all to keep going uh, podcasting. I don't want you all to fucking go to Comic-Con. That's got to <laughs> end. <laughs> You no, sons of you bitches. You can't have, a, 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 have Camp Panda Beef in memory of you? No. <laughs> no. Comic Con's dead. All right. You can have Fantastic Fest. Yes. We all know that's all you want anyway. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why you have four days at Comic Con, <laughs> sir. Well, Brad doesn't believe in, in, uh, in cremation. He wants to be buried. But what we'll just bring... At Arlington National Cemetery, I know I have never served. Just put me on top of Lee Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we can do is, is just burn all of his black nerd shirts. He has like a cl closet full of black nerd shirts. And then we'll just spread his ashes of, of nerd shirts onto, onto a Fantastic Fest. I, and if anybody complains, I'm like, that's my husband's ashes! And I, then I'll cry. I can't go spread them out in the, uh, the, the San Diego Bay. Right oh, there. That, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Well, no, this is what you do. Okay, I want my torso buried, but you can like cut off some limbs oh, and yeah. burn those down, and then like you know spread my arm, my right arm, out in the San Diego Bay. Some spread, in the whole H line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> spread my left arm on Lee Marvin's grave at Arlington <laughs> National Cemetery. All right. uh, take my leg to Austin, Texas. Spread it on the Alamo Draft yes. House. Possibly even like do some, some sort barbecue. of masseuse. I'm gonna put it on some barbecue. <laughs> oh, and feed that barbecue to Tim Alamo. I'm gonna I mean, eat Tim it. Lee. Tim I'm Lee. Gonna eat it. I'm gonna well, eat you it. can have some of my ashes. All right. I, I'm gonna take some, and then I'm gonna be like, Tom Cruise, can I get a hug? And he's like, Sure. And then I'll and then be like, just... <laughs> I just blow it in his face. I just blow it in his face, like 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 fairy dust. Yeah. You have to you have to burn down my lips for that. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. And my penis. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how how you cure Tom Cruise of Scientology. 
edgy. He's like, I'm not clear anymore. I'm not clear. I'm covered in dick ashes. Dude, if my dick ashes clear him of Scientology, I will have done great work for cinema. That's oh, shit. Oh, Nicole shit. Kidman and him could get back together all because of my dick ashes. Man. What I want to know is what's going to get Carmen Electra and uh, that guitar... Navarro, Dave Navarro, when they broke up, I was really sad. Oh, really? Yeah, for uh, some reason, I was like, the, I was like, these crazy kids can make it work. Love is real. And then they broke up. <laughs> the first celebrity breakup that really hurt me was Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin. Oh, yeah. 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 And then I, I found out what type of people they were already. Oh. So I'm okay with it. All right. Yeah. They didn't block. Okay. Um, <laughs> what else you got, Lisa? So um, Pat Oswald. Oh, yeah. So Pat Oswald was amazing. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, it's a pleasure to see comedy in any stage. Like, I've, I've seen like, um, I've seen a. Uh, oh fuck! Why am I forgetting his name? Um, Jim Gaffigan. Not Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> um, it's the only comic I know. You know he makes the oh, movies Greg Proops. with Ira Glass. He makes the movies with Ira Glass. Ira Glass makes movies. Yeah, with and, and we saw it at. at um, oh, oh, Hannibal Burris. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen too many fucking comics. You know how long this list is? Oh, my God. Uh, um, not Kathy Movie Bates. about improv. Oh. Uh, the- Mike Birbiglia. Mike Birbiglia. Oh. So we saw, uh, we saw Mike Birbiglia at a workout show. Do, or were you there? I think it yeah, was. Yeah, I was there. Okay. So I, we saw him at a workout show, and I was just like, you know, this is... This, Work, workout this, show being like, well, like well, he's I got working some new material. out material. Okay. And um, I was like, oh, that that was really, you know, kind of hit and miss. You know, he's working stuff out. But now the the bits that we saw are his latest Netflix special. And mm. it's amazing and it's awesome. Yeah. And so it's a privilege to see comedy at any stage. I'm sorry, I just I, with my enthusiasm, I just knocked my cans off. My headphones, <laughs> yeah. not my tits. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yeah, so it's a privilege to see comedy at any stage, and um, and yeah, and Pat Oswalt was beautiful, and getting to see him at at this time is terrible because it's sad that he lost his wife, but it's also like a privilege. You talk about it. Uh, Brad mentioned the 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 other comedians that you've um, like Tig. What was her last name? Tig? Nataro. Nataro. I have not seen Tig Nataro. Well, I, well, I, I mean, the, I mean Nataro. the specials and the platform. The, they use comedy as a platform for that catharsis to talk about these things. And you're just thinking about what happened to Patton Oswalt and his um, recent tragedy and him getting out on the stage. And not, oh, he's so brave to get out in front of all those people. But like you said, to go from that place of, I don't even know if I can tell jokes anymore uh, or tell jokes about this, but to see him overcome that, to end up on that stage to continue to do what he does for me that's inspiring because in all and like you said all comedians do that all comedians they 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 tell jokes and a lot of them tell jokes that come from a place of and tragedy even if they don't tell personal jokes they're telling jokes where they go out there and they say i think this is funny and when mm-hmm. and just putting yourself out there to that degree is well, just a complete emotional free fall like you know i think this is funny do you think this is funny too? And if they say no, I imagine that that's devastating. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm talking specifically about the the comedians who do tell the jokes about personal stories, about personal stories and, and that you know place, the places of tragedy, and how inspirational that is. Because I look at it like when I go through pro- when I have problems or I have friends who have problems, family, the advice that I try to give myself and give my friends is, you know, yes, you're going through this one thing, but you have to keep going. Life it, life goes on. You have family. I have a daughter. You have people who care about you, people who need you. So you have to find a way to keep going. And I know from my own personal issues and, and trials and things like that, how hard that can be just from, like, and I haven't lost a wife. I mean, I have situations where I have to look myself in the mirror or think about my daughter and say, well, Darren, this is your lowest point of your life. You have to find a way to keep going. And I know how hard that is. So I can't even imagine losing, you know, your companion, your life partner, your soulmate, and then telling yourself, well, I have to get out of bed today. I have to go raise this, continue raising this seven-year-old girl. And I got a seven-year-old daughter. So when you said her age, like, that just gave me goosebumps and brought tears to my eyes. Because I can't imagine having that conversation with her, telling her that, you know, mommy's not here anymore. I I can't even imagine that. So the strength that that takes to get out of bed, 
to continue being a father, to continue raising her, and then to continue being a comedian, and then the potential for that to touch other people and inspire them to, you know, yes, you're going to be at your lowest point many times in your life, but you have to keep going after that. So when comedians do that, like, I just, that's just inspiring. And he, and, like, he doesn't talk about, like, he doesn't see, talk about it like he's being a hero at all. Right. um, mm-hmm. One thing that one bit that he did that I thought really s- spoke to how how he's feeling and how he's processing it, what is like pop culture has completely misrepresented what grief is like. Like uh, Bruce Wayne loses his parents and he starts doing push-ups and learning martial arts and he becomes Batman and. Pat Oswalt loses his wife, and he eats wheat thins for breakfast. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, so he, he really is just humanizing it, going like, this is what grief is like. It's not pretty, and it's, not, and it's, and it's hard every day, and some days you fail. Well, and he's also showing what, you know, we all do. What, Darren, what you've done on this podcast, you've talked about in the past. You experience something in life, whether it's positive or and maybe even especially when it's negative, and you take that life experience and you bring it into your art. The Itmod art is podcasting, and we bring a lot of our lives onto this show, even when our listeners don't aren't even aware. And I think that's the example that Patton is proving right now. He's not a hero. He's just doing what he does. This is his mm-hmm. thing. He's bringing his life to his art, and the we benefit from it. Exactly. Yeah. Another thing, just to just kind of put a button on this, but um, um, in preparing to, because it it had been a while. Like this was, like, Saturday, when did we see this? Sunday night. A week ago. It was. It's. It's been a while. So it's just kind of trying to refresh. Um, that terrible Logan review cast got in the way. Oh yeah, that's right. So I'm um, sorry, listeners. <laughs> so I had to kind of refresh so and sure. remember. So I've been looking over interviews and stuff. And he's also in other in other of his specials he talks about a person who deals with depression in his life and he has a great bit about like being a person with depression in the apocalypse and how um he's just going to be like the most useless person because he's just going to be so sad um (laughs) i don't know i this is why i'm not a comedian um but he uh he's now talking about he he's been comparing the the sadness of depression with the sadness of grief and how he's saying like that grief is really making the sadness of depression look like the coward that it really is and that the sadness of depression is um, really just looks like a bully next to the sadness of grief. And as a person who's dealt with depression in in my past, it was almost kind of comforting <laughs> to know that the sadness of depression is not is not a real sadness, and that it's a sadness that is being pushy and a sadness that is making you feel things that are, is not real. Yeah, and you know. I know, I, you know, I know that grief is a part of everybody's life, and I hope I can push grief as far into my future as possible. But just the him talking so openly about it and saying like, I have grief is a scary thing. It's a scary monster that is <laughs> that is coming for all coming for all of us. Mm-hmm. But him going like, I I have grief. Grief is a part of my life, and I'm moving on, and I'm moving. Not moving on, but I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward with this grief. I'm still doing my art. I'm still taking care of my child. I'm doing my the best that I can to take care of myself and take care of my wife's legacy. And I just think that that's awesome and 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 that's comforting. And it is critical in all art, it's, yeah. it, even comedy. Yeah. So and we've had a lot of really great examples with that as of late. Yeah. So. Um, go see Patton Oswalt if he's coming to your town. Watch Lori Kilmartin's um, 45 Jokes About My Dead Dad. Go listen to Tignataro's Live album and all of her subsequent albums. And her first album, because it's great. It's jokety jokes, but they're still good. And it's it's a nice, 
a palate cleanser from all the sadness, I guess. <laughs> um, but I learn, I learn from comedy every day. I learn from comedians every day through my podcasts and through their specials. And, and I just, I love it so much. It's an art form that's near and dear to my heart. And may, you know, and I hope that other people enjoy it as well. I was Yay. trying out um, Netflix's 4K streaming. Oh, my God. Ooh. Fantastic and Fest the, 4K TV. And the first <laughs> thing that I watched was Amy Schumer's The Leather Special, I think it's called. Oh, yeah. Her latest special. Yeah. Um, so I watched some comedy, too, with stand-up. Yay. I think she's funny. I, I, I happen to dig Amy Schumer. She's weird. But she, I dig her sense of humor. All comedians are weird. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I like I like her. So her movies, not so much. I won't be movies going to are see hard. Snatched. Uh, train I, wreck. Dude, I love Train wreck. I'm seeing Snatched. Goldie Hawn is back. I will follow. <laughs> okay, I have to see it so we can talk about it. But I like her stand up. I really do. So yeah, I was I thought about I thought about you when I was watching that. Um, this week, so I watched some stand up as well. Darren's week in Dork is going to be insufferable. Just I know. Prepare yourself. You know what's coming. Uh, is that it for you, Lisa? Yeah, I rewatched Get Out yesterday. Yeah? I was oh, going to watch nice. John Wick 2 because I wanted to see something new, but then work called me in. So I was like, I don't quite have time to watch a uh, you know, two hour and 20 minute You haven't movie. seen John Wick 2 yet? No, I still haven't. Huh. I know. I am failing as a husband. But I did have time to watch an one hour and 44 minute movie. Yeah. So I watched Get Out again. Still a good life choice. So, such a great movie. Great. And just like you guys said, I, I like this time I took notes yeah. because I, you know, it was my second watch. So I took notes. There were still things that I found in, uh, found the second time I watched it that I didn't find the first time yeah. I watched it. And of course, knowing the end of a movie that kind of has a reveal at the end and then watching the movie with the context of the reveal is always very illuminating. And it really puts, I mean, the the girlfriend relationship, mm. watching it with the knowledge that mm-hmm. you have, having watched the movie one time, oh, it's sinister. Oh, it's so creepy and sinister and awful. And even the second time, I'm still like, still kind of a cute couple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. So it played better for you the second time then? I wouldn't say that it played better because um, I think because I was watching it analytically a lot, I had kind of sucked a lot of the suspense out of it for me. Okay. I, I look forward to um, waiting a while to watch it again so that I can feel scared again. Yeah. Um, I love the song in the opening credits. Childish Gambino. Yeah. No, that not the, the Childish. Swahili song. Oh, the Swahili in the truck, in yeah. the car. Yeah. I love that song. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I, so I, I noted each time that, that, that theme, theme came up, yeah. back and it was yeah. just really, it's just really engaging. Mm. Um, the incident with the cop mm. in the beginning, mm-hmm. I started going like, what, what was the point of that scene with the deer and that interaction with the cop? And like, what was her motivation being so chill and se- cool seeming? And then, and then I was like, put it together. I was like, oh man, but she's just yeah, I know it's the second time, like when she stops him from giving him his, his, his ID. ID. I was like, just there's, like, there's the first time you're that. like, yeah. what a cool hip girlfriend. Yeah, Way but then you understand why. Awesome. And then you're just like, oh, bitch, I'll kill you. <laughs> I will kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, manipulating my boyfriend it's like so, that. <laughs> uh, it's so well directed. Yeah. So well directed. So good. Yeah. So, so I look forward to. In 2018, when we're doing our It Mod Film Club of this movie, <laughs> it will happen. Yeah, because it's happen. gotta happen. Mm-hmm. The so many little like I was taking little quotes about uh, like oh we have black mold in our basement. Oh yeah. go to hell, you fucking evil <laughs> cunt. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that that was my weekend dork. All right, B, what do you got? Uh, so. A couple weeks ago, uh, Darren and I saw Kong Skull Island at an advanced screening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, 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 we should we haven't talked about it on this podcast yet. We've now all seen it except for Lisa. Yep. Because okay. she's sleeping all the time. I'm, I'm, it's not my fault. I've got a good uh, condition. Uh, I, so we should probably talk about it a little bit. Go ahead. And I was. Disappointed. Disappointed. Yeah, yeah I wasn't okay. deeply disappointed. It wasn't yeah. like the solar plexus punch that was Logan mm. uh, and how frustrated I was with my lack of enthusiasm for that film. Yeah. And that frustration only grows with every person who sees Logan and tells me it's the greatest movie on mm-hmm. the planet Earth. Yeah. 
Uh, I really wish that I could see what they see. Um, the Slash Film Cast actually just did a really great review of Logan uh, that I thought um, really got to uh, both sides of the story because uh, Dave Chen and Devendra Hardwar, they loved the movie and Jeff Kanata, similar to us, was kind of lukewarm on it. And it's interesting exploring... Uh, and now, now I'm getting distracted back to my, to my Logan frustration. But it's interesting exploring when a movie doesn't click with you. Uh, more on that later when we mingle on social media because mm-hmm. we got some response to our Logan oh, cast. No. Okay. Uh, I hate it when we get a response. None to of our it's Logan good, cast. Lisa. <laughs> uh, uh, but Kong was a different kind of disappointment. I don't think I one I had the build up uh, for Kong Skull Island the way I did for Logan. However, my fanboyism, the way it got in the way of Logan, also kind of got in the way of Kong Skull Island. Yeah. I love, 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 love the original 33 film. Mm-hmm. I even like the Jeff Bridges, yeah. uh, Jessica Lang garbage fest. That, that movie is not good, but I really like it. Yeah. And Peter <clears throat> Jackson's King Kong, for as many flaws as it has, I love that movie crazy and the reason i love it is because i love kong Mm -hmm. as a being um as this you know uh personification of nature and how we do terrible things to this planet and we are constantly taking it for granted and we want to harness it for our own uh desire and power and that's what king kong is about and there's some of that in Kong Skull Island. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Kong Skull Island is so in love with being or attempting to be Apocalypse Now and this one dimensional tip of the hat to a, another masterpiece that it gets in its own way and doesn't explore that concept. It it nudges against it, you know, the idea of the scientists, the monarch uh, mm. group going to an island to, you know, bombard it with uh, explosives to test their hollow earth theory and uh, justify their own budget by finding the lost island of monsters. But the characters in Kong Skull Island... yeah are so paper thin. We Very. talk about Headshot having a thin plot. No, but this But is... this is like non-existent. Yeah. Michael Bay on Armageddon. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he, he does a character. better job than what Kong Skull Island does. Because Ar- well, Armageddon's a fucking masterpiece. Well, that, that was I my love main, Armageddon. High five, Lisa. That was my main issue uh, with Kong Skull Island. Is I, I, I enjoyed the film a lot. Um, I enjoyed a lot of the moments with Kong, but... The characters, I thought, were, like you said, very paper thin. There were only a few characters that I could really gravitate towards and that I thought really had a backstory. But everybody else really just, there was nothing really to them. Well, the heart of the film is certainly John C. Riley, And yes. he's the best thing in the amazing. whole movie. Yeah. And going into it, you're like, oh, oh, he's going to be the Dennis Hopper comic relief of mm. Kong Skull Island. Yeah. And he actually no, there, there's a lot more to his character. There's a lot more to his character, and but but Riley sells that. There's I would say there's a lot more to his character because standing next to Tom Hiddleston and uh, uh, Brie Larson, uh, Brie Larson mm-hmm. he looks like seven dimensions compared to their zero dimension they're, character. Yeah, they're they're the worst. That's the worst. And I mean, Sam Jackson has a little bit. They they really tried to build up his character. Well, um, I think. He's he's certainly that archetype of you know he's the soldier whose war has been taken away from yes. him, and the beginning of the film I think that works really it's really very well. Interesting with that, yes. But after he witnesses Kong yeah. tearing apart his helicopters, the way he gravitates all his rage towards the monkey doesn't make any sense, especially when it's an island crawling with these bird lizard. Things. Exactly, exactly. And I, I enjoyed uh, the story. <laughs> Of Toby uh, Kebble. Oh, I hated that. Well, I enjoyed, that's interesting, Brian. But I, I very interesting. <laughs> I enjoyed. <laughs> I enjoyed the idea of 
him and him writing a letters to his son. Um, but then what ultimately happens, I was like, okay. Like I'm, I'm, yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's what I mean as far as it. But I, I enjoy it with the potential of where that story could have went. So but. if they had taken 10 more lines of dialogue and given those to each character, you might have had a, a, a Michael Bay movie. But this is like subpar Michael Bay. This is the worst of the worst Michael Bay. It makes me appreciate those films in a light that I did not think possible. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not a Michael Bay hater by any means. Yeah. On this podcast, I've, we've talked, you know, mm. I think I defend the Transformers films most of the time from you guys. Oh, <laughs> most definitely. <Yeah. laughs> I'm not saying Age of Extinction was good. I'm just saying that Dark of the Moon had some moments. That's interesting. Uh, Maybe oh, one, not many. No, it had that whole Chicago scene. Anyway, well, let's not get distracted. <laughs> We're going to have Transformers cast later this year, oh, no! and then we can talk about it. Uh, we're going to do like the fast cast where we go through every Transformers oh, movie. Oh, man. Uh, but Kong Skull Island, it, the, 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 the gaping hole in that script that is any kind of character development just makes the cool action beats, the cool monster mash stuff fall flat for me. So... There are some scenes or some movements that Kong does. Like, I love that scene where Kong goes up against the big lizard thing and he pulls that tree off and then he yeah. rips all the branches off. He's got a big old baseball bat. Like, yeah. that's like a fist pumping moment. But everything that I love about King Kong in the previous incarnations, his actual character, he, he does not feel like a, a, a living, breathing entity in Kong Skull Island. He feels like a storyboard. A really well drawn storyboard. It's weird because I feel like they try to replicate some of those moments, like the moment with Brie Larson when you know he comes up from. Like, that's like it's so. Basic. I agree. I agree. I agree. But like I feel like paw print. I feel like the filmmakers are trying to recreate the the essence of Kong from the thirty three <laughs> and the and the Peter Jackson. They're trying to trace. They're, they got some tracing yeah, paper yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but but yeah. I don't think they succeed in any way in replicating that. I think for better or for worse, <clears throat> in your case seems to be for worse, Brad, I don't think that... I think this film is trying to differentiate itself from the 1933 Kong and even, even the Dino De Laurentiis. No, <clears throat> I disagree. I find that interesting, that comment you just made. <laughs> but I disagree. As far as I think it's trying to... to it, it, it is pulling itself away not from <clears throat> the original King Kong movies. It's trying to differentiate itself from Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. And it's taking all the complaints that people well, had towards that exactly. film yeah. and saying, we're not going to hide the beast. We're just going to have nothing but beast. And instead of two hours of character work, and it's not like you know that Godzilla film was th- that in-depth in character. But it's better than this movie. Yeah, because I actually went back and rewatched the second half of Godzilla um, <laughs> this weekend. Uh, just, I mean, just because well, I Cause was you actually just wanted to get to those mutos. Well, no, actually, I, I was watching the film and I stopped it, and then when I picked up, I was just able to resume on my digital copy. Your movie watching lifestyle is it's, it's, bonkers. It's all over the place. I, I know. I, I, I apologize to the listeners too. But watching the second half of that film, I do agree that Godzilla, even though with the complaints of not seeing. Godzilla a lot in that film. They do uh, rewatching it. I think the character building in that movie is a hell of a lot better compared to Kong. So it's almost like they have they they trade one for the other in each film. But there needs to be a blending of both. And so I think. Kong, Kong Skull Island is a straight B movie, and I think oh, yeah, yeah. like Logan, if I didn't have this oh, deep seated love yeah, for yeah. the original films, I, I I probably would have just enjoyed. Skull Island for what it was, just a monster mash. And like when that spider comes and impales that dude through the throat. Yeah, that was. How'd you handle that? That was fine. I don't, I don't, I don't trip. I just trip off the big hairy That's, okay. tarantula. Yeah, yes. That's it. But I'm, I'm good right, with everything. Spider on your back. No, <laughs> but I'm good with everything else though. But but yeah, but that was, they have some great sequences. I also think that the the villainous monsters. Uh, the, the, the skull crawlers, the skull, skull crawlers. crawlers. The design's not good. Yeah, I just don't think. It, yeah, it that looked, design they wasn't that great. And uh, it, it's funny too because they they in that final uh, fight scene, they always thought that he was going to do the same thing as far as like you know pulling the the jaw apart. Uh, 
but they they go away from that. And it seems like Kong will be easily uh, easily be able to do that to, to those creatures. Oh well, Kong could could yeah. I mean, they they were they were no problem. And you know, they talk about the big one, and when the big one shows up. And it looks just like the little ones. It's just a slightly larger. Yeah, you're just like, oh, well, this is. Yeah. Cool. And to me, it just Bring really back felt that no octopus. Felt no match really to Kong. Right. Really to me. Um, I I can think of a moment where they come the closest to where, where it comes the closest to showing the Kong that we all love, and that's when he's in the water before the octopus attack, and oh. he's putting his hand in the water to clean the cuts from the rotor yeah, blades. Yeah. I I did get some goosebumps there. Yeah. So yeah. I mean I I had a good time. I want to take Lisa to it. Lisa, it is not technically VF. Um, the, oh, the, the skull, skull crawlers crawler. regurgitate some <laughs> skull bones. Just a skull. Yeah, and, but so. they make some like <laughs> oh oh, like, oh gross, oh, gross noises, and you know it's that regurgitation Ooh. CG look. You know. Anyway, so I'll, I'll cover your eyes during that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it dispatches characters very casually. Like, yeah, that I also thought was disappointing. Very disappointing. I don't want to. Me. I won't spoil who they were. Yeah, but you're just like, what? What? Huh? That's it? That guy's gone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Same way I felt. yeah, uh, three stars. Kong Skull Island. I mean, it's, I mean, it's decent. It's I, okay. I would say three stars as well. I mean, I, so, I, I enjoyed it. I actually had a lot of I fun. Had fun wa- I had a lot of fun watching it, <sighs> and. Um, I mean, no, like no, no spoilers, but I, I really enjoyed the post credit scene too. Well, I went nuts, especially with that. Yeah, I mean, I am, I am looking forward to where this series goes. I just hope that they didn't learn all the wrong lessons from Godzilla, the Gareth Edwards one, because I would like more of that than this yeah. going forward. Yeah. You know, I want to care about things in Godzilla versus King Kong. I want it to be an epic. I want it to be four hours long, directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> Grimlock's there. Wow. Uh, so, the, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. I saw that uh, over at the Alamo with Lisa napping next to me. Uh,. <laughs> Jack Black is so bad oh. in that movie. Bad as far as bad acting, or just a uh, like an, a sinister character. No, no, like as in bad acting, or at least making the wrong choices. You think I, he was miscast? I feel I don't know if he was necessarily miscast as yeah. Carl Denham because I feel like he could. I mean, honestly, I feel like he's he's performing in the outdated style of the thirty thirty film. I agree. Uh, whereas. Mm. Other actors in the movie are a little more contemporary. contemporary. You know, Adrian Brody's still. No, oh, he, he was oh, in that. You know, yeah. he's, he, he's, he's not natural. It's not a natural performance. But Na- Naomi Watts is amazing. She's really good. She's in, really in the good. film. And, and the way she sells the relationship with Kong. Yes. You know, Peter Jackson's film, you know, I think P- the weakness that people see in that movie is it's so overindulgent. It takes every tiny iconic moment from the thirty three film and says, We're gonna take that scene, turn it into a twenty minute sequence. We're gonna take that scene, we're gonna turn that into a thirty minute sequence. We're gonna take an hour to build up to Skull Island. And I love, love the Depression era New York build up to the island. Mm-hmm. I love everything about it. It makes it a three hour movie that might be too long for most people. It's not for me. If you replaced Jack Black, or if you told Jack Black, hey, dude, tone it down a notch. <laughs> uh, and if they maybe reworked that brontosaurus chase or just cut the brontosaurus chase completely out of the movie, mm. the effects really don't work. It is interesting to watch King Kong, uh, the, was it 2005, Brian? Mm-hmm. 2005. Shit, it's yeah. been 12 years. Yeah, so yeah. it's interesting to watch the 2005 King Kong next to Kong Skull Island. And to see the leaps and bounds that CG work ha- has progressed. Because yeah. the, the Kong in Peter Jackson's movie, while the mocap and Andy Serkis' performance certainly comes out mm-hmm. in that film, it's very flat. The rendering? The rendering is round. Hmm. And what I love so much about that film is all these scars that Kong has. Because you... Yeah. You see the 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 length of time that he has spent alone on this island battling all these crazy V Rexes and what yeah. have you. But on some of these close ups of his scarred face, 
it looks very shiny, very uh, uh, flat. And, hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of play doh in places. Yeah, I, I can see that with, especially with um, DVD or Blu ray watching it. Well, I mean, I was watching on the big screen at the Alamo. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it, that's it right. definitely oh, stood okay. out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, when you see these these jumps in technology in such a short period of time, mm-hmm. you just think about, you know, I was so awestruck by that movie. And then I was awestruck by Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. You know, how will I look at Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in 10 years? Yeah, you know, yeah. Or, I mean, how will we look at Rogue One? You know, when we're watching our Bruce Lee uh, CG film, Darren. Dude, next. <laughs> next topic. Next topic. Uh, I mean, that's really Fuck. it. I did want to touch a little bit on a reaction video oh, yeah. that Brian did yeah. this past week. <laughs> As he mentioned earlier, a whole bunch of great trailers came out. Mm. I'm excited for all of them. Yeah. But Fate of the Furious, watching okay. Brian's reaction video. You really? cry tears of joy? Uh, yeah. It, it, no, not it, necessarily. It's sad, Darren, because Brian. <laughs> Brian is struggling as a fast fan. Huh? Have you watched this reaction video? No, I've seen the trailer, but I was <laughs> I assume like Brian I, I saw whenever Brian posted, I get the email from YouTube saying, you know, your trailer is posting now blah 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 blah, so I know okay, the new reaction <laughs> video went out. Knowing Brian's love of that franchise and knowing that that trailer just got released and then seeing it, I just assume like, well, Brian's going to be gushing about this trailer and that's it. Yeah. So you well no, that's well, not no, what happened. I, I have some reservations. Well, see, here's the thing. You need it. to go back and listen to our fast cast and then our Furious 7 review because Brian's reaction to Furious 7 was not uh tears of joy. It I was remember very that. Very confused. I don't know how I feel. Maybe this is too silly. Yeah. And his reaction video is, you know, there's that scene in the new trailer where you learn that Charlize Theron has hacked every car in New York City. And she has turned this army of of supercars against yeah. Vin Diesel. And there's this, like, I think Brian yeah, refers so to like it as like a, a buffalo herd. Yeah, it looks like of a herd cars. of buffalo. Uh, and and he, doesn't, he, he doesn't like it. He feels it's what he calls, quote, dumb and fun. Yeah. And he wants to go back to the way it was. Because for Brian, his love of the Fast and the Furious movies was part one. You know, he was on board from the first film. Yeah, yeah. And ever since Fast Five, that's where we've had a shift in tone, where those films have just gotten bigger and crazier. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say dumber. I would certainly, yeah, I would I would say maybe sillier, Darren. Don't look at me like that. Don't cock that eyebrow. <laughs> or B movie yeah. in in tone. Yeah. And I have really embraced the insanity of the post Fast Five universe. Yeah. I'm and, not, and Brian's struggling with it. Well, see, that's the thing because I and I agree. I think Fast Five was a turning point. I, I think that's kind of like the, uh, the the pivot point of the franchise because for me personally, I've been on board with this franchise from the beginning in 2001. And I think in Fast Five, um, and I said on my reaction video that I think they did a great job of blending the insanity of the action, but really staying grounded to the characters that they've built up until that point. Um, I think, and like we discussed before the podcast. I think Fast Six kind of um, kind of carries over into that from what Fast Five did, going a little bit more insane. But I actually really enjoyed that. But then when we get to Furious Seven, it feels like they are really starting to get away from that idea. Even though they mentioned family and that idea, <laughs> they mentioned it like eight times. Yeah, but just the whole idea of times. of the characters that they've built, regardless if you think the characters are paper thin or if you care about it. Like for me. I've invested a lot of years into loving these characters, and now it feels like it's almost like they're taking them as a joke, and that bothers me to a degree. And I don't know. I was thinking about this actually driving here. I mean, it's I don't know if this is weird to say, but after Furious Seven, like personally as a fan, I don't think I've really gotten over the the passing of Paul Walker. Like I want. I don't know how I'm gonna feel about Fast Eight with him not being there. It's just I don't know. I just have conflicting feelings about. This whole this whole thing, I don't know. I I understand. I think Furious Seven, why that film doesn't quite click with you the way that Five and Six and the previous films did yeah. is because one, Justin Lin, 
Yeah. That yeah. is became yeah. his franchise after Tokyo Drift. Absolutely. Right? And he crafted it into something very unique. It's a singular vision. Furious 7, James Wan. Yeah. He just doesn't cut it. It's not terribly directed, but it does feel jumbled. Tonally, it also feels weird. Mm-hmm. I think because Paul Walker passed away untimely, yeah. that affected where that story could go and how they could tell it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, F. Gary Gray, he's made some okay movies. He's made some pretty good movies. He's yeah. made some bad movies. We'll see what he does. Yeah. I'm enjoying everything I see in the trailer. Is it dumb and fun? I won't use that word. I don't like the word dumb. My grandfather told me never to use it. I won't. Okay. I'll say right. it's silly and over the top. Yeah, I can And agree I that. respond to that the same way that I did with Armageddon and Michael Bay movies. Absolutely. And Bad Boys 2, sir. Bad Boys 2. Yeah. And, I, and to be honest with you, I don't have any problem with it being silly and fun. But I don't... It, it's just, again, for me, I get caught up in the uh, the the reactions to everything I hear outside and the way other people respond to this franchise. It's like, Oh, you know, it's just, it's just dumb, fun action. There's no reason to care about the characters. And for me, it's like, no, I love these characters. You know, it's more than just watching cars blow up and, and do, even though that's great to watch, but, um, but I, I like this, uh, this melodrama. Um, and, and you're going to get it. And I don't think the filmmakers think that they are just making silly things now that they are getting, I think, they generally love what they are doing yeah. and that they are approaching it from a non-cynical place. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You should too. I'm trying. I like I said I have I just my feelings have really are really being conflicted. And like you say, I think this will be um uh a very uh interest is fast eight for me personally watching this how I respond to it. Um they have 10 movies scheduled, so after this, we're getting at least two more. But Fast X in space. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I don't know how I feel about that. But, um, then gets an upgrade. <laughs> but if, I, if I'm not that enthused with this eighth film, uh, I, I, just, I don't know where my excitement is going to be after this. Here's the thing. I don't want you to read... Or listen to a single I, review. Yeah. If it's coming from Collider or wherever, Brian. I know. I'm trying to do Don't do it. Yeah. We need to watch it together. Yeah, we'll yeah. hold hands <laughs> like Dom and whatever and, Brian. And, no, Brian. And Brian's yeah, character. Yeah, O'Connor. Yeah. 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 And, and Brian O'Connor would. You're watch no, it I, I, I agree because I feel the same way about Power Rangers as well. Like, it's just the, these outside forces. And I'm trying to create this bubble for myself to... That nobody can penetrate. And, I'm not uh, going to be there for your Power Rangers. Good luck, man. Oh, man. Come on. That's interesting. <laughs> but I have a question, Brett, and I'm not being um, patronizing. I, I, genu- <laughs> I like what Darren approaches it me, not patronizing. Um, so when you, when you, you said that you like the Fast and the Fury franchise and you can appreciate it for its silliness and its, um, its thin characterization. I didn't say that. I didn't say I could appreciate it for its thin characterization. Well, I did not say no, 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 no. It was a positive. <laughs> no, no, no. But you, but you even you know, I know what you're about with, to say. Even with the thin characterization, you're talk about the Kong thing. Yeah, you're, how, you're talk how, about Logan. No, 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 <laughs> no. How I just want to know, like how, Here, like how can, like how are you? All right, first off, can't first off, appreciate Kong. I don't fucking know. <laughs> That's true. Hey, be honest, yeah. you know, the way I respond to like. You know, why? how come I cry every time at the end of Night and Day when Tom <laughs> Cruise walks across the patio with the bullets flying by him just so he can kiss Cameron Diaz? Do you really? Y- yes, I do. <laughs> really? Dude, I love their love. He I, never told, I never knew you cried uh, for Night and Day. I don't think I've ever said that before on this podcast, which is oh, surprising. That's but dope. Like, to me, I get choked up watching that scene. Yeah, when, they yeah. finally, when they finally embrace. Yeah. At, you know, because she's so... Uh, Oh, okay, we're not. We're gonna do night and day cast some other day. I can't, <laughs> I can't go there. Okay, but, you know why I respond one way to one film, and you would think I would respond in the same way yeah. to another film that is similarly working in a B movie realm. I yeah. don't know. I can tell you that <laughs> this is this is interesting, and I had not thought about this until you mentioned it. The way Brian feels about Furious Seven and what could be Furious Eight. I think his hang-up is the same hang-up that I have with Kong and Logan. He's bringing a fanboy love, Mm. a really deep-seated, many-year, decade-long, decade-plus-long love affair with Dom and Brian. And he wants those characters to be treated in the way that he expects them to be. Respected, yeah. 
And that's how I feel about King Kong. So I have a, I have a, a very strong idea of how Logan should behave. That's yeah. why I've, I have a very strong idea of how all the X-Men should behave. And when the films don't do that, it's why I don't like it. That's why I can love Age of Ultron. And, you know, people bash on that movie all the time. And they say, well, I can, they don't say all the time, but a couple people have tweeted that, you know, how can you love some of these Marvel movies and not dig on the X-Men films? Mm. And the reason is because Marvel Studios gets the characters right, even when maybe the editing isn't right or the script isn't 100%. They get the character right. And that's why Age of Ultron is a masterpiece compared to Logan, in my opinion. Yeah. So Fast Five happens. I had no love or interest for these characters. Fast Five happens. What Justin Lin does with action cinema and car chases and the rock lathered in baby oil (laughs) and the chemistry that those characters now, for me, appeared to have by bringing in everybody, by creating the Avengers of the Fast and the Furious films. Because I had seen all the movies beforehand and... I like them to varying degrees. I never really like. I still, I'm sorry, Brian. I still don't particularly like the first movie. Okay. I kind of hate the second film, but yeah. I watch it because it's now part of the saga. Yeah. I love Tokyo Drift. Fast and Furious, not bad. Fast Five is a masterpiece in action cinema. Yeah. And the film gets those actors in a way that those actors have not been gotten to before in their other works like uh um uh vin diesel i was not a fan of really until fast five Mm -hmm. and because that film used him to such a a uh in such a perfect way and or at least in such a way that that accentuated that script and that story yeah i started to like vin diesel and I started to like, uh, what's Brian's, uh, the actor's name? Paul Walker. Paul, I started yeah. to like Paul Walker. And I love Gal Gadot. And I love Han. Han, yes. I love Han. Yes. And all of them together. Tyrese. Suddenly, I'm like in love with Tyrese. Yeah. And that film made me appreciate, or at least uh, reconsider the previous films. And now I like all of them together. Yeah. I own them all. I don't watch them every year. I probably watch them, well, every year a fast movie comes out. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. I watched it when Furious 7 came out and I'll watch it now that uh, Fast 8's coming out. So, I think that, I mean, that's what it comes down to. Mm. And, you know, uh, I would also say that sometimes it can just be a particular set piece that I fall in love with that yeah. works for me. Do yeah. you also think it's the personalities of the character regardless of that character is thin or whether the script is thin? It's just that personality, the charisma? Because well, I, mean, uh, I, I, I agree that yeah, Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson are not... But the thing is, is like, dude, how how did that how did Kong Skull Island find a way to misuse Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson? Yeah, I love both of them. Yeah, and yeah. they are so boring in Kong Skull yeah. Island. And then Nothing. the opposite is for me when when the uh, the advertisements first came out for Kong and the trailers comes out, I'm like, okay, cool, I'm on board. And then John C. Riley pops up. I'm like, ooh, like what? What is he doing in this movie? Ouch! I know. I love him next to Will Ferrell. If he's if he's pairing off of him and playing off of Will Ferrell, if he's in a comedy, yes. But what they were presenting in that trailer, and then he pops up, and then his lines in taken out of context. I was like, ooh, I don't know. Oh man, is he going to be like the the irritating comic relief? But it's the like like you mentioned, like he is the best thing in that film. He is the heart of that film. His Closing credits, going home, like had me tearing up because of his work in the rest of that film. Whereas Tom Hiddleston, who as soon as he pops up in the advertisements in the trailer, I'm like, oh yes, I get to see uh, Tom Hiddleston in like an action kind of role. Oh yes, this Miss is Captain Marvel, Brie Larson. Like hopefully, you know, her and Tom Hiddleston will play off each other well, but they don't. And so I didn't find anything charismatic about those two characters. But for John C. Riley, for um, the guy who plays Easy E and Straight Out of Compton, Jason him, Mitchell. he and um, uh, Wingham, uh, Shane Wingham, Shane yeah. Wingham, like I, Whoa. even though they didn't do a lot, and their script was them, I enjoyed the charisma and how they played off of each other. So for me, that's what kept the fun going along in, in, for me in the film. Because again, the script was not 
it was non-existent pretty much. It was nothing there. It was really thin. The characterizations are really thin. But the just the 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 way the performances were and how they brought those characters to life and the personality is what had me saying, okay, at least I had I mean, some fun th- with. That's it. the <clears throat> thing about movies, Darren. It's all subjective because yeah. everything you just said, outside of the, the John C. Riley stuff, yeah. I disagree with. I, like yeah. even Jason Mitchell, I couldn't really care for him. And John Goodman, I thought was a waste. And Shea Wingham, outside of me going like, dude, I love that guy. Yeah, he was wasted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Corey Hawkins. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I didn't like Corey Hawkins. No, and no. what was the Asian girl that was the supposed? She to be was that? in. Uh, that's the girl from the Wall. Oh yeah. <laughs> She's, she's in there way be- better in The Great Wall. She's in there because China co-funded well, China. the film. Yeah, and exactly. there's a completely different cut of Kong Skull Island for China. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's probably a lot. So, you know, why why do I love Fast Five and Night and Day and not Kong Skull Island? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Uh, what else you got? I mean, that that's pretty much it. I mean, I've, you know, yeah, that's all you need. That's all I'm going <laughs> to give you. All right. Uh, I, too, saw Kong Skull Island, as we discussed. Uh, I watched that's that a great issue. weekend, Dork. Well, it's been wonderful. Let's <laughs> bring you on social media. <laughs> Boy, the, the B. Kendrick, he's got some interesting things to say about our Logan review. Um, yeah, but before we get to that, no. uh, I, too, had a weekend, Dork. All right, uh, I got to go to the bathroom, guys. Which I watched <laughs> Kong Skull Island. Um, I watched Amy Schumer's The Leather Special. On Netflix, and uh, I did a lot of rewatching of Ugh. some older films, not older films, but films I already own. Uh, because, as mentioned in my fistful of resolutions, um, my it my resolutions, one of my resolutions was to up the resolution of my television, and I have done oh. so. So I'm now in the 4K Congratulations. realm. Congratulations! I should have gotten you a card. It's okay. <laughs> I didn't know it was a special occasion. Congratulations on your. You're, you're new in your home. That's nice. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, I could use a sympathy card, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we can't afford a prettier TV. So what I did was I went and um, I just rewatched because uh, I had future proofs. So when I got the Batman, the BVS uh, disc, Whoa. I Sorry. bought the 4K <laughs> version so that I would have it. And uh, and I the Deadpool, when it came out on home video, I got the 4K version as well. So I had those two movies to watch. And and. The so you bought the 4Ks before you had the TV. You was getting the prepping. Yeah, for it. I was, okay. was future proofing because I knew I was going to get it at some point. So, <laughs> so I had those two movies to watch, and then the the PS4 Pro it, it upscales your Blu-rays to quote unquote near 4K resolutions. So I I popped in um I popped in some of my my I, the Doctor Strange Blu-ray. I watched that one in 3D and uh, and uh, some of my uh, the other Marvel films like Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, and Bad Boys 2, uh, we were just talking about Michael Bay and um, car chases and sequences. So I put on that, that chase That's sequence. Is it 4K? No, no, no. I just put on the Bad Boys 2 Blu-ray. Oh, okay, okay. And um, holy shit. It upscales it? or is just... Yeah, it upscales uh-huh. it. No, it doesn't upscale it to well, 4K, yeah, no, but it upscales no, it okay. higher than 1080. Okay. Um, man, the, that, that, BVS, uh, <laughs> that BVS in 4K, um, super, people are always saying, well, you know, Superman's colors... Zack Snyder had some so drab, or whatever. Like, looking at that disc in 4K, his blue is a royal blue that pops off the screen like nobody's business, and it contrasts with the red and the uh, the crest on his chest. It well, just amazingly. The table's lifting over here, Darren. Calm down. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, all like all of the colors in that film, uh, the with the higher resolutions, there are details that. I can see in Batman's suit um, that I didn't notice before, and I've watched the film in 1080, uh, 1080p, and they're just they're just details like smaller details that you can see in 4K that the details aren't necessary, but they're there. So there's a scene at the end when they uh, when the SWAT team storms the ship and they see Luther in that pool talking to Steppenwolf oh, or the whatever. Oh, the Luther scene. Yeah. yeah. Well, when those SWAT team guys come in there, the resolution is so high. They have uh, on their rifles, they have uh, what they're called. They call the, the red dot sights. I can see the fingerprints on the lens of the the scope and the dudes <laughs> and the dudes friggin on his gun. Do you need to see that? No. Does it matter? No. But it's there. Like you can. That's how high the resolution is. That's how much <laughs> detail pops is that. And it's not even something that's framed for you to see in the shot. He's not even pointing it really in a prominent direction at the screen. It's kind of off-center, pointing it like off to the left or somewhere, but he kind of moves but it. But now so aren't for you getting se- distracted by thumbprints? 
No, Did no. You be watching the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> well, luckily these are movies that I've seen already, so I I can I can appreciate uh, the the finer details in the in the image. Um, and so I got a sound bar because so prior to getting the TV, I'm just excited because oh the the, the higher resolution and. Um, I'll be able to see more colors, and it was all about the TV and the image. But I got a sound bar to put in in the disco den, so that I'm not just using the the television speakers. Holy shit! I would say this surprisingly, the sound bar and the subwoofer. I have two surround sound speakers for rear channel, and I have a subwoofer in the back. Um, I would say the sound upgrade enhancement is more substantial than the video upgrade with 4K. So watching my homework assignment, Zodiac, watching Bad Boys 2, that chase sequence that starts in the garage and ends on oh, the yeah, freeway, yeah, yeah. the bass and the the guns that the Haitians use, mm-hmm. the audio, the channels and the surround sound when Michael Bay has the camera panning from left to right and the cars going from the left side of the frame to the right, just the spatial sound and the direction of it was insane. It was nuts. The audio from... Um, the BVS, uh, the, the the score, like everything is just enhanced. Um, people talk about home theater setup and the TV and the big push is 4K now. I'm guilty of it. You know, the resolution and the screen size and blah, 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 blah. But sound, as it's always been in cinema, is just as important as the oh, image. Yeah, yeah. And for a proper film experience, uh, viewing experience... If your sound matches the quality of your your video, then it takes it to a different level. I I was just amazed. There there was so much there was so much bass. The sound field was so rich. There are things in the audio, smaller um, audio cues and sounds and directional positioning that I had not picked up just watching it on a standard uh, just two channel soundbar in stereo before. So I. I this the past couple of days I've been more impressed and blown away by the upgrade in the audio than I have for my upgrade in video. Um, it, it's making me rewatch like all of my movies now in five point one surround sound. And yes, it's nice and lovely that I have that the the four K image. But I'm telling you, if you can get a good surround sound system, if you can get a good you know two channels up front center speaker and then two rear surround sound. If you can afford that or you can get one, I would highly recommend it because it it cha- it totally changes your your viewing experience. And so, just like uh, the upgrade in Theater A in uh, the Alamo, when you sit in the proper seating, or if you watch something like Fury Road, compared to watching that at home and just the the, the directional surround sound in the bass and that subwoofer I got shakes the freaking house. Uh, the bass is so dramatic and huge. That opening of Fury Road, I had to pop that in there. Man, shit is nuts. <laughs> it was just like watching it in theater A. Like it, the bass kicks so hard. So that's what I've been doing. I've been slowly rewatching like my filmography and watching something like Zodiac, um, which I'll get into the actual movie in our homework cast. You know, that film is really dialogue driven and um the score and mm-hmm. the score sticks out much more than I had even anticipated. I'm just thinking of the visual aspect, knowing David Fincher and how he shoots, and and with the pedigree of the cast, you know, I was just focused more on or expecting to be engaged in the acting, but the sound in that film and how it's used uh, and to build tension and and um, coupled with the 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 score was really impressive and it really enhanced my viewing of that film. That it really is character driven. It's really driven by the story and the performances. So I don't know, like that I. I'm very excited to go back and again continue rewatching like my catalog so of films. So when are you having us over for a movie night? We want to experience this. I'm uh, skeptical of everything you've said. I don't believe you, oh, you for have a second. To, yeah, you I have know. to see it for yourself. All right, you know what? I'll I'll see what I can do. I have to put I'm, something I'm together. I'm inviting myself over. All right. I'll bring cupcakes. I've really been in the mood to make cupcakes. Yes. I'll bring okay. cupcakes. All right, we'll have to work something out. So uh, this replicates the theater experience. So Okay, the... okay. Let's call uh, it. No, no, back, nothing, sir. Here's, nothing replicates a theater experience. I, I'm, I'm joking. But I'm joking. it's the next best thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the next best thing. And what if you bring cupcakes? And that's pretty great, too. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, so, is. yeah. Uh, so that's <laughs> pretty much my weekend dork. Um, I've, again, just been re-watching like, my, my Blu-rays and stuff. And so... <sighs> 
made the leap to 4K. Also, uh, for PS4, um, Horizon Zero Dawn just got released. Um, also, the Nintendo Switch just got released, a new handheld thing that everybody's going nuts about. Yeah, you really can't know. find it if you wanted it. Uh, our buddy Ryan Sears got one, uh, but I didn't get one. But I did get a copy of Horizon Zero Dawn, which is this open world game. It's it's post apocalyptic. It's post post apocalyptic, and uh, the graphics in that game is in 4K, and that shit is just amazing. Post post. Yeah, so it's after. So if you do post apocalyptic, <laughs> and then you go up one extra apocalyptic <laughs> after post apocalyptic. Oh, okay. Yeah, like it's. I'm I'm pretty sure Fury Road is post post apocalyptic. <laughs> well, it's post post because post apocalyptic. Mad Max is. Post apocalyptic, <laughs> right. kind of, and then Road Warrior happens, and then Fury Road. So yeah, it's post post apocalyptic. Well, it's uh-huh. Horizon Zero Dawn is post 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 apocalyptic. Okay. okay, triple post. Yeah, triple post. <laughs> uh, and that game is amazing in 4K. So yeah, <laughs> we call that the three P's. P P P. All right. So yeah, um, the triple let's, P. Let's uh, mingle on social media. Yes, time to Uh-oh. face our medicine. Face our medicine. Yeah, that's how, face I'm mixing music. my metaphors, Lisa. Well, we don't have to take it, do we? we got to take the music and face our medicine. There you go. That's right. I can face it. I just have to take it, right? Lisa's with that back talk again. I don't want to <laughs> uh, So first up from uh, at Gojira underscore lives. Jesse. Hi, Jesse. I know that guy. Hey, congratulations, too. He's a dad now, like yes. me. So he's awesome, like me. I hope that doesn't cut into his... Uh, Podcast listening time. If anything, it's going to increase. It. Yes, <laughs> introduce that, the baby to the it podcast. That's right. I make it. I. I mean, I know that you generally don't self nominate, but I would make an excellent godmother. Yay! <laughs> I'm already godmother to one of my nieces. I'm not quite sure which one. <laughs> no, don't admit that on air, <laughs> Brad. Anyway, uh, Jesse says. He, you know, he's, we're doing a little bit of this uh, corrections and omissions thing uh, here, but uh, he, he just he just wants to say that adamantium poisoning is a thing in the X Men comics, mm-hmm. and then he sent me a link to a YouTuber mm-hmm. that that showed me that I was wrong. Mm-hmm. That adamantium poisoning is a thing. Mm. Okay, all right, I'll give Logan that. Mm. It's a thing, and it was poisoning, not cancer. Okay, all right, fine, <laughs> whatever. Um. I think that's a point for me. I don't know if we're taking points, but okay. I'm point but for does me. that make the movie better? No. Yeah, I know. Wait, wait, but does that serve the film? I mean, even though it's in the comics, like for me personally, I don't care if it's in the comics. Yeah. I mean, I don't read comics that fuck much, them but comics, huh? I mean, no, not necessarily fuck them. But I'm just saying, like, just does it serve? Does the adamantium poisoning serve the film? Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is That's a point what the in about. the film, and it serves that point. Is that a good choice, though, Brian? Well, there we go. Is that a good choice? It was. Uh, I'm going to. Sh- we're going to take this to another place. <laughs> but I reread the Old Man Logan comic this week. Uh, I saw your uh, Instagram, I think. right? Yeah. And okay, it's a completely unfilmable uh, story. It is a post, post, post apocalyptic story. Four posts. Yeah, it's a quad post, oh, shit. quadruple post apocalyptic story. That's practically a table. Uh, where. <laughs> Where, uh, damn Lisa, that's funny. You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where Logan uh, is going on a road trip with old man Hawkeye to Aww. deliver a package to the president of the United No, not the president of the United States. Enemies of the president of the United States being Red Skull in this post, 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 post apocalyptic event. And, you know, there's. Uh, Venom symbiote dinosaurs in it. Hulk yeah. has some uh, rapist hillbilly children and, and, bread, and yeah. grandchildren. Uh, it's, it's bonkers. It's crazy. It's funny. I, I listened to a podcast recently, Geek History uh, Lesson, uh, where they actually go through like all the issues of because I've never I've never read the Old Man Logan and listening to them go through the comic, I'm like. Was this really something that it, it people is wrote? Like, so it's so Mark Millar absurd. Wrote that, right? Yeah, it's Mark Millar that and Steve sense. McNiven, and McNiven's art's amazing in it. But it's it's just such a comic booky thing okay. that you normies are not ready for. Okay. However, what I like about the structure of Old Man Logan is after this horrible event <sighs> happened in the past, he's sworn off violence. It, I mean, it, Old Man Logan is basically Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. He's sworn off violence. He's never going to resort to popping his claws course, ever again. Yeah. And for the whole series, he never 
pops his claws. Um, even when he gets to the you know the, the big boss fight at the end, he 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 vanquishes his enemy without bringing the blades out. Then something happens, and it unleashes the berserker rage. So when you get to that final issue and those final panels of that final issue, and his claws pop out for the first time, I think I know what you're talking about. it's insanely uh, satisfying. In a really sad way. Well, you gotta tell me. Is it is it when he comes back from the road trip? He comes back from the road trip. Yeah. Things haven't gone well on the homestead. Yeah, yeah, I know. And he has to find the person responsible. Yeah, okay. And it is a crushing sequence. And so for how, even though this is an incredibly silly, over the top, fast five e kind of comic (laughs) book, Brian. Yeah. The way it treats those claws is incredibly satisfying. And I wish that that was the aspect that James Mangold had replicated rather than, you know, the kill crazy rampage for the entire runtime of Logan. It's a complete, I mean, honestly, the old man Logan comic and the movie we saw, that's apples and oranges, mm-hmm. as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but you know, I don't know. It was interesting. Uh, we're mingling on social media, so I should get back to it. <laughs> Interrupting everybody. Um, so at B Kendrick eighty six sent us two tweets about our Logan. What's cast. up, Kendrick? He did an amazing uh, Inside Out cosplay. Him and his lady. Oh, that awesome at, con at last awesome year. Awesome con. It's truly inspirational. So uh, Brandon says maybe the previous X Men movies are just the ridiculous Logan Universe comic book versions of what actually happened. Discuss. So Wait, say that again. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Maybe the previous X Men movies are just the ridiculous Logan Universe comic book versions of what actually happened. So the Brian Singer films, Apocalypse, Days mm-hmm. of Future Past, uh, you know Matthew Vaughn's First Class, those are really just uh, comic books that exist within the universe First of, of Logan. Logan. That's like that, way like too that, much like work. that comic book that the girl had. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So. That's way too much work, Lisa? As a viewer. Like, that's trying to explain something away to me. I think Brandon's making a little jokety joke. <laughs> I, I get jokes is all I'm saying. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, uh, I wish I wish that was the case. I don't know if it is. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, I'm going to dismiss all those films because they're not, not my X-Men. Not my Trump. So, not my X-Men. Wait, no. Well, who's on. your fucking Trump? No, no. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> not my president. Not, sure, not my X-Men. <laughs> but... So he's saying that Brian basically, Singer's by Trump. So basically, he's saying that the, the the previous films never really happened within this universe. We're watching live action versions of. The but you can't. But I you can't movie. really follow that point because they reference those films in Logan. It's they, meta. They, yeah, they reference the Statue of Liberty. They reference like a lot of these different moments from the previous films. So you can't dismiss that they're just. I'm comic fine books. with like the I you know I know that it, this isn't a particularly like dork stance to take. I'm fine with picking and choosing, um, like what in the past you want to count yeah. and what you want to discount. I'm kind of fine with that if yeah. the movie is good. It's the fact that the movie wasn't so great that mm. these things are bothering us. If the movie was better, we would be able to kind of shrug these things aside. Mm-hmm. But the fact that we were left unsatisfied, that leaves us to look for these little nitpicky things. I psychic high-fived you, Lisa. Oh, it felt great. <laughs> And uh, he sent the second tweet, and he just wanted to say he loved Logan, and he made it through our entire episode, by oh, the way. Oh, nice. No hurt feelings. I'd agree with most of the issues and had mental retorts. And then he gave a little kissy face emoji. See? Oh, with the that's heart? That's what oh, the no. world needs. With we the need heart. more people oh. like that. See? Yeah. yeah. Accepting uh, of our difference of opinion. And keeping your... Your retorts on the inside, where they can't hurt my feelings. That's, that's good. That's a good move because I'm. I talk a lot for someone who's so sensitive. Well, when you coked up, Lisa, you ain't gonna feel shit. I'm really looking forward to this. You're really selling this pretty hard. The coke thing. Man. All right, Thanks, what else Darren. you got? That, that's it. That's it. There were a lot of uh, you know other uh, people who just chimed in and said like we were wrong. And, oh, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Why? Why are you saying sorry? Stop that shit. You're not sorry. No, I'm not. I'm editing that out. I think all the, all their comments were interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, 
everyone who, uh, well, the two that uh, submitted questions for the podcast. We appreciate you listening. Uh, Brian. Yes. What do you got coming up this week? What are you looking forward to? Beauty and the Beast? Beauty and uh, the Beast? Yeah, but before Beauty and the Beast, uh, we're Both all taking a, a road scared. trip. Yeah. the one prepared. Beauty and the Beast. Okay. That's lovely. Right. Aaron. Ariana. That was me. That wasn't Lisa, by the way, everyone. Ari- that was gorgeous. Ari- Ariana Grande or whoever. Oh, no, that was Darren. I, I know, I know. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying. But you're also <laughs> fancy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, this week, of course, Lost Weekend uh, oh, Seven shit. we got coming up. Oh, shit. So, so, so yeah, so we got that, uh, which is going to be exciting. We'll, I guess we'll be uh, we'll be podcasting episodes from there, and um, uh, I'm also going to be shooting some footage uh, to put together a little piece, a little package together. So, trying to get some st- things together. So, yeah, looking forward to Lost Weekend. Of course, Iron Fist drops. Um, you and the Beast comes out Friday, so hopefully after Lost Weekend, I can kind of you know catch up on Iron Fist and maybe go see Beauty and the Beast. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of great stuff coming up. So uh, so yeah yeah. And uh, uh, what else do I want to say? Um, YouTube, uh, please check out the it my YouTube channel. I'm putting up videos, uh, putting up a lot of content, uh, reactions, reviews, uh, a lot of stuff. So definitely go check it out. I'm putting up the uh, the podcast episodes in YouTube form, the audio. So uh, if you can't listen to the iTunes version, definitely check out the YouTube page and uh, while you're there go ahead and check out some other stuff as well and sc- subscribe and like that's a thing that they definitely, say definitely definitely please rate like subscribe 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 they do the YouTubers do the thing where they point to corners and tell you to do shit yes uh, to the left, I'm, I'm, I'm to working the right. I'm working on getting some of those little uh, things uh, in place as well I watch a lot of nerdy nummies so I know what <laughs> YouTube's all about Brian you should know that I've just recently subscribed to our channel oh Nice. So you were the 51st. <laughs> you are one of two channels I subscribe to. Oh, oh, nice. What is the other, if I may add? I'm not sure. Oh. oh. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, oh. And you can find him at Brian William yes, Young on Facebook. Yes, you can find me at, uh, yes, yes. Find me on the social medias at Brian William Young, Turtle Dork, the Turtle Dork One. Uh, what's, the other, what's the other place that I'm keeping up with? Letterboxd. Tinder. Oh. <laughs> I also like the videos where you get an overhead view of people cooking things. I can watch that shit for hours. I don't know why. And it's not like I'm making the things. It's just meditative for me. I can just absorb it. Yeah. All right. Lisa. Yes. Oh, yes. My plugs. <laughs> um, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd, at Sidewalk Siren. And do you know what I'm getting super excited for? It Mod Month with... Film Club 3.0. Oh, shiggity. Oh, yeah. So this May? Is it May? What yep. month is it? May. May. The lusty month of May. We, um, it Mod is going to be sponsoring four films, each uh, programmed by each of us dorks that tells a little piece of our cinematic history. We're sharing a little piece of our cinematic history selves with you and um we're hoping to keep you posted and that you guys come out and watch our films we're gonna intro them up on the mic uh yeah it's gonna be awesome yes <laughs> so um where should they wa- follow for that so make sure you're following at cinema bandwagon mm-hmm. that's andy guyerson he's the programmer at the alamo draft house winchester yep. and i don't think i don't think all the films have been secured yet so we can't Yet Can't reveal spoil them. what those no. movies are. Listen to the band. Lisa, no, no, no. Clock in the sky is falling away. The There's so much to say. I can dig it. Brett. Can you dig it? I see a lot of lawbreakers out there because that's what Darren's pick is. Magic <laughs> Mike Double XL. Oh. Right, Darren? Yes, and we will be performing a routine uh, prior to the introduction of the movie. I have brought the Rock's baby oil. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> and we'll be handing curves. out It Mod banana hammocks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. You don't even need a gun for those. You can just fling them. Yep. <laughs> Bread. <laughs> you can follow me on all social medias at Mouth Dork. What are you looking forward to this week? This week, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> all right, and I'm Darren Smith, the Disco Dork on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Uh, please, please, please watch out for our Matty Doe interview coming up with uh, Billy Das, the indie dork. Uh, we got that coming up in conjunction with Film School Rejects. 
Uh, stay tuned for our Fistful Friday. My homework assignment, Zodiac. Uh, this rounds out my month of homework. So sad. Uh, but I will be looking forward to discussing that and rating my homework assignments. And then we got It My Film Club coming up the following week, and that's going to be Old Boy. Maybe not the following week no, because we got after, a bunch of yeah. uh, Lost, Lost, Weekend, Lost Weekend stuff. Mm. Yeah, but after that, You old have at boy. least two weeks to prepare for It Mod Film Club. Yes, and please watch the film or rewatch it if you've already seen it, which you should have because it's awesome. And, and use it's the hashtag... Mm-hmm. At It Mod Film Club. Yep. Share your thoughts, yep. your cues, your A's. Yep. Share your A's with us. Oh, all right. And also on Friday, we got a fistful of beauty and beasts. Beauties and beasts. Beauties and beasts. <laughs> That's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. And until next time. <laughs>